All right, so good evening, everyone, again. <clears throat> there will be mountains that I will have to climb, and there will be battles that I will have to fight. But victory or defeat, it's up to me to decide. But how can I expect it when if I never tried? Oh, I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy and i don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me never said there wouldn't be trials never said i wouldn't fall never said that everything would go the way i wanted to go but when my back is against the wall and I feel all hope is gone, I'll just lift my head up to the sky and say, help me to be strong. Oh, I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy and I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. I just can't give up now. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy and I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. And I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. All right, so it is now time to pray. If you would all, the young people, if you would come forward, please, as we begin to honor your prayer request here in this box. Also, we also have a very special request for a young man named Nathan. Um, he has hurt his neck very, he's a five-year-old baby who's hurt his neck. He's not able to keep his head up, and apparently he's in a lot of pain, so let's also keep him in prayer tonight. So those of you who are looking for special prayer, if you would come forward, those of you who have placed your prayer request in this box, would you also come forward so we can go ahead and pray for you? And as always, adults, if you would circle around our young people. Close your eyes and bow your heads with me, please. Oh, I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to come on down. Dear most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for the opportunity of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for another uh, day that we've been able to make it through. Lord, we thank you that we're in the house of the Lord at this time. 
Lord, we ask you right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will be with little Nathan, Lord, whatever issues and pain that he is going through, Lord, you, you know his issues, Lord, you know that he is hurting right now, and I ask, Father, that in the name of Jesus, that you will heal him. Help him, Lord, to see better days. Lord, all of our young people who have placed their prayer requests and our adults who have placed their prayer requests inside of this box, Lord, you know what they are, you know who they came from, and we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would answer those prayers. I pray, Lord, that you would put a special covering over our young people. Lord, continue to bless them as you have this week, Lord. I pray that you will be with Isaiah and Angela as she, they give the word tonight. And I pray, Lord, that as you have used the past speakers, Lord, that you would use them tonight as well. Continue to help us, Lord, to follow in your, in your light and in your footsteps. Lord, I ask that you would help us to all continuously be reflective lights of you. Please forgive us for any sins that we've committed in words, these thoughts, and in action. Lord, I ask that you remember the sick and afflicted, the poor and needy everywhere. Lord, please remember the prayer members, the prayer list, and the prayer requests. We also ask, Lord, that you will continue to be with Paradise SDA. Lord, as they are making changes, Lord, to uh, accommodate our youth, to become more like you, and to employ our youth, Lord, to work in your service. Lord, we are thank you so much for the powers that be. We thank you for willing youth. We thank you for just the, the spirit moving in our church. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us and what you're continuing to do. And most of all, Lord, we pray that you'll save us in your kingdom when you do come. Thank you, Lord, once again, and we love you. And this is our earnest prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing the two speakers that I had the pleasure of mentoring. First, after my voice, you will hear Angela Hannah Marine. She was born and raised Seventh-day Adventist. She's an honor student at Odyssey Charter School. She loves staying active, and that includes playing sports such as volleyball and basketball. She is active in the Pathfinder ministry and has placed first in multiple marching competitions, including the International Camp Marie, as well as many Bible Bowls. Her favorite food is dill pickles. Yes, dill pickles. <laughs> We're not gonna hold that against her. Her favorite Bible verse is Psalms 14.1, and it says, the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. After Angela's beautiful voice, the next voice we will hear is Isaiah James. He is currently a sophomore at Doral Red Rock Academy, and he's also a junior deacon for our church. He is active in the Pathfinder ministry as well. He's great at math and really good at marching. His favorite food is pizza, more normal. His favorite Bible verse, Hebrews 12, 6, that says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Thank you very much. Good morning, church family. Good evening. Good evening. I'm sorry. So I'll, part, I'll start off with this. Have you ever been confused in what you believed in? I remember about 10 years ago, every night, my mom and my family would have a devotional. And she will always end with the second coming, the trials and tribulations, and how the Christians were going to be persecuted. And that my only answers was yes or no. Yes, that I would die and live for my God, or no, that I will die, no, I will live, but reject my God. I was born into it, but I didn't know how to be a Christian. I was raised into it, but I didn't know how to be faithful. What makes a Seventh-day Adventist different? What, make, what does it mean to me? Let's start with the word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you that we're all here today. Please speak through me, and please help everyone here to understand. Give us knowledge and understanding, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. amen. The difference between SCA, what does that mean? Does it mean the difference in religion, the difference in culture, or maybe the difference in our everyday lives? What is the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Before I go into it, this is just a little history that we should know before. The Seventh-day Adventist Church falls under the Protestant Christianity denomination. Christianity is broadly split into three main branches, Catholic, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is Protestant because we believe in the Holy, in the Trinity, which includes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the resurrection, and the second coming of Christ. Who found it? The founders of Seventh-day Adventist Church was Ellen G. White, Joseph Bates, James Springer White, and J.N. Andrews. Ellen G. White was an author, and she wrote many books and had many visions sent by God. She wrote, she was a prophet and spoke God's word and was a proclaimer of the will of God. She predicted and explained her visions through her writings and that Seventh-day Adventist practice to this day. Where did it come from? The Seventh-day Adventist Church came from Battle Creek, Michigan. It came from the root of the Millerite movement in the 1830s to the 1840s, during the period of the Second Great Awakening and was officially founded in 1840, 1863. The Second Great Awakening was a time of evangelical fear and a revival in the newly formed nation of America. It was Protestant revival movement during, expressed through Armenian theology through revivals that every person could be saved. Why are we different? The Seventh-day Adventist religion is different in identity, beliefs, and culture. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the Bible is a true source of their beliefs. So what makes us different? What makes the Seventh-day Adventists unique is our beliefs about death. It's quite different. Adventists do not believe that we go straight to hell or heaven, but we believe that the returning of Christ in judgment, also known as conditional immortality. Adventists share many of Protestant Christianity, basic beliefs, including acknowledging the Bible's authority, understanding the existence of human sin and the need for redemption, and believing in Christ's atoning mission. The purpose and beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist religion. Our true and main purpose is to bring man closer to the Lord and spread his divine truth. The purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist church is to bring man closer to God, building a relationship and practicing his ways with other people so that people can reflect from our actions and have a Christian-like attitude. God wants us to spread his word and his love to those all around us. The Ten Commandments are first introduced in the book of Exodus. And if you will turn with me in Exodus 20, verse 6. And if you're there, please say amen. Exodus 20, verse 6. <laughs> and it says, But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This verse tells us keeping the commandments will have the Lord show mercy on us, who love him and keep his commandments. Adventists believe in worshiping on the seventh day, which is on Saturday, keeping the Ten Commandments. There is more than, that, than this that just makes us different. There are many times in the Bible that mentions Jesus and other people that worship on the Sabbath. How do we know that Sabbath is on Saturday? Because it refers back in the book in Genesis and Exodus that the resting day is on the seventh day. Near the beginning of Genesis, God was making his creation of the earth. And it says on Genesis 2 to, 2, 2, 2 to 3. In Exodus, it also mentions chapter 20, verse 8 through 10. It specifies more on Leviticus 23, verse 32. And if you will turn with me with Leviticus 23, verse 32, please say amen if you're there. And it says, it shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict the souls on, on the ninth month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Explaining that the Sabbath shall be celebrated to evening of Friday until the evening of Saturday. The 28 fundamental beliefs. We believe in the 28 fundamental beliefs because it is a part of our seven-day Adventists. And it takes a major part of it. The 
the Sabbath. The theology of the Seventh-day Adventist Church resembles of a Protestant Christianity. Adventists believe in the infallibility of Scripture and teach that salvation comes through grace, through faith in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. One of the major differences in the SDA religion is our day to worship. The word Sabbath directly means from the Hebrew Shabbat meaning to rest from labor. It is used for the seventh day. If you turn with me on Genesis 2, 2 to 3, it says, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. In this verse, God finished all his work, and he blessed it and rested. And rested on it. The Sabbath, what it means, directly means. The seventh day of the week, observed from Friday evening to Saturday evening, as a day to rest and worship by Jews and some Christians. Definition B, Sunday, observed among Christians as a day of rest and worship. If the case was that Sunday could be a day to rest and worship, worshiping on Sunday is not wrong, but if that was the case, worshiping on any day can be a day to rest and worship. Therefore, in the fourth commandment, Exodus 8 through 11, as Rebecca said, says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It says, remember keep it holy six days you shall labor and do your work but on the seventh day is the lord your god in it you shall do no work nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your, fem your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who was in the gates for in six days the lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day therefore the lord blessed it and hallowed it the key words remember Remembering, saying there's only one day and no other day that God rested, which was the seventh day. Keeping, to keep and worship God only on that, that day. Sabbath, that Sabbath is a day to rest and to worship on the seventh day. This is a brief explanation, but I hope you guys got the gist of what I'm trying to say. About how the Sabbath is on seventh day and how the seventh day is on Saturday. The second coming of Christ. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When when he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected, and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven. But the unrighteous will die. The almost complete fulfillment of the most lines of prophecy, together with the present condition of the world, indicates that the Christ is coming near. The time of the events has not been revealed, and we are, we are therefore exhorted to be ready at all times. The second coming. Second coming is a Christian and Islamic belief regarding the future or past in other, some religions. It is the returning of Jesus after his ascension to heaven about 2,000 years ago. The idea is based on a messianic prophecy and is part of most Christian eschatologists. Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus will physically come again for all his believers and for his final judgment. No one knows the day or hour Jesus is going to return, but he wants us to keep watch. For the Bible reveals events and signs that he is going to come. We can compare to those that what is happening today. In 2 Peter 3, 3 to 4, it says, Knowing this, the scoffers will come in their last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things as they continue from the beginning of creation. Guys, many of them will doubt Jesus. And they will continue to do their sinful ways. The Bible says there will be false prophets, the change in laws, and the Christians turning away. In Matthew 24, verse 21 through 25, it says, For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sakes, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says, look, here is Christ, or there, do not believe it. For the false Christ and the false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. It's, po it's possible even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. The Bible says there will be false prophets, and will they, they will make wonders and great signs. And they will try to deceive us, proclaiming they are God. If you read more, if you read your Bible, the whole chapter of Matthew 24 it talks about the great 
signs of times and the end of age, the great tribulation, and the coming of the Son of Man, and many more scriptures, examples, explained through parables. In Isaiah 24, I read it, and it was really interesting because it talks about the destruction of the earth in the end days, that many would doubt and question God, testing him and even mock. The resurrection. Did you know the wicked will also be resurrected? The wages of sin is death, but God alone is immortal, will, gr will grant eternal life to his redeemed until the day is death is unconscious day for all people. When Christ, who is our life, appears, the resurrected righteous and living righteous will be glorified and not will be glorified and caught up to meet their Lord. The second resurrection, the resurrection of the unrighteous, will take place a thousand years later. When God comes back for his second coming, all the righteous will rise, and he will take the righteous to heaven. The wicked people, wicked people will not rise, but remain dead, and Satan will rule the earth. While the righteous stay in heaven for a thousand years, after the thousand years are finished, the righteous will come back to earth, and all the wicked people will suddenly resurrect, and all including Satan will bow to Jesus knowing that he is king. But they will remember, they will pride themselves. And then they will make a war against Jesus. They will fight against each other. God's army will conquer Satan and his army. God will purify the earth and will bring heaven to earth, living an everlasting life. Now what? Are we truly prepared? We speak different languages. We dress differently. We have different jobs different styles. We live in different countries, cultures, and neighborhoods. We work, worship God in different ways. We all celebrate, all confess, all shout for joy in a million different ways, and we all are Seventh-day Adventists. I'm sure that you all have friends and family that believe differently than you do when it comes to religious belief system. Not only do you know about it, but you're also exposed to it one way or another. Sometimes we can see similarities and differences with what we believe. And though we may look, pray, think, sing, and share differently, we all look forward to the Sabbath. We all look forward to the future when Jesus will come again. It is our very name, this anticipation of the seventh day, and this longing for our another advent. Our history and the future as a movement is rooted in this awareness of time and the prophetic importance of our message in these final hours of Earth's history. We are a diverse, pe we are diverse people looking backward and forward calling to share with everyone that the world is on the verge of beauty. No matter where we are, what our organization looks like, how we live our beliefs, and how we keep the Sabbath, we are longing for the last days when we finally be present with our God. Amen. Amen. Isn't it amazing that we could live an everlasting life with our Lord and Savior, that we could have wings like angels, and that we could hear the trumpet sounds when God is coming? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. First off, I would like to thank each one of you for coming to throughout Youth Week of Prayer sermonettes and for supporting us through prayer and by making the sanctuary not empty. <laughs> um, I would also like to ask you a question. Who here has your Bible with them? Raise up your hand. Amen. All right, so before I start off, I would like to say that I used to be part of a um, Spanish mega church. all right? Now, the only reason why I'm saying this is because our topic is the difference between Seventh-day Adventists and other Christian churches. Most, and in this sermonette, I'll be mostly comparing it through my experience the mega church that I attended to, which was in Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, so these are the topics that I will be talking about tonight. And the only reason why I'm talking about this tonight is that I was never taught this in the mega church. I was never taught where, 
Well, I was taught where we went to, but it was a false teaching. The and then the next topic is the millennium and the end of sin. I was never taught that. Instead, I was talk taught about the rapture, which is an also another false teaching. And then I was taught, I was never taught about tithes, but I was told to donate money continuously and to never stop. And a matter of fact, this money that the megachurch has received was never been used for evangelism. As we learn on Tuesday or Monday from Marlon Jr. and Abraham, yeah, Monday. And the next topic would be what day we should keep holy, which is an easy answer because it's actually in our name, Seventh-day Adventist. Now, our first topic would be, do good people go to heaven when they die? So where do they actually go? Well, the honest truth is that they don't go anywhere. So where could they possibly all go? As a matter of fact, they just stay in their tomb until Jesus returns and resurrects us. So please take your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 29 and 34. Because we're based on the Bible. Say amen when you have it. And it states, man and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And then, in verse 34, it states, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. Also, also please take your Bibles to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 30. And 29. Say amen when you got it. All right. It says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. It is really interesting how the Lord provides biblical verses from to support our everyday questions when we have them uh, now we're going to talk about the millennium and the end of sin and as i said i was never taught this during the mega church when i was when i attended the mega church so now the millennium is the thousand year reign of christ with the saints in heaven between the first and second resurrections. During this time, the wicked dead will be judged. The earth will be utterly desolate without living human inhabitants, but occupied by Satan and his angels. At its close, Christ with his saints and the holy city will descend from earth, from heaven to earth. The unrighteous dead will be resurrected with, and with Satan and his angels will surround the city but fire from God will consume them and cleanse the earth. The universe will thus be freed from sin and sinners forever. And for those of you that don't know, I would just like to also point this out that most of these topics are part of the 28 fundamental beliefs. So please take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, verse one through first. Say amen when you got it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the bottomless pit. With a large chain in his hand, he captured the dragon, that ancient serpent, also known as the devil, and Satan, and tied him up for a thousand years. Verse 3, he threw him into the bottomless pit, locked it, and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were over. After that, he must be set free for a little while. Verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony 
about Jesus and because of the words of God. They had not been they had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came back to life and ruled with the Messiah for a thousand years. We are so blessed that the Lord has shown us mercy for the things we have done through the years, but yet we are so fortunate that we will still be able to praise the Lord when he comes and takes us to his kingdom. So now we're going to talk about tithes. I know it's about money, so. <laughs> so please take your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Say amen when you got it. Any tithes of the land from grain grown on the land or from fruit grown on the trees belong to the Lord. They are sacred to the Lord. Now, the Holy Scriptures teaches us that a tithe or a tenth of our income is holy unto the Lord. Unlike the free will offering, a tithe is biblically mandated to be 10%. It is the portion that he has reserved for himself. In ancient times, this means 10% of one's crop or herd. Today, it's a tenth of our income, or in the case of a business, a tenth of the profit. God has given us clear directions as to use of the tithes. It is devoted to the support of those who are bearing God's message of mercy to the world. These are the pastors, evangelists, Bible teachers, and administrators. Without members giving a faithful tithe, the means of supporting the work would be crippled no single congregation would fulfill great commission to take the good news to all the world, but the churches work together. God blesses their united efforts. The tithe dollar starts its journey from your local church, and it's first sent to your local conference. From there, a portion goes to the local union, and then on to the North American Division and the General Conference where it is dispersed worldwide to support gospel workers everywhere, including the general conference itself. And finally, we're going to skip that. <laughs> finally, we're going to talk about what day we should keep holy. Now, as I said, the answers within our name, seventh day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, thirty. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So please take your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 and 11, as Rebecca already read. Say amen when you got it. And it says, remember the Sabbath day, maintaining the, its holiness. Six days you are to labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You are not to... You are not to do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your livestock, nor, your, nor any foreigner who lives among you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. But many of you would say that, that Jesus resurrected on Sunday, but a matter of fact, he kept the Sabbath while he was still sleeping. And since Jesus is our example, this still applies to us. So please take your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Say amen when you got it. And then it says, Then Jesus came to Nazareth, where he has been raised, and as is his cousin, custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he still went. The gracious creator after that six days of creation rested on the seventh day and instituted the Sabbath for all people as a memorial of creation. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of this seventh day Sabbath as the day of rest. 
worship and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of delightful communion with God and one another. It is a symbol of our redemption in Christ, a sign of our sanctification, a token of our allegiance, and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. The Sabbath is God's per per perpetual sign of his internal covenant between him and his people, joyful observance of this holy time from evening to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative redemptive acts. So I expect you guys to come here tomorrow to see um, tomorrow's sermonette. church members are we doing our part or are we sleeping just trial times are approaching now more than ever we have to pray for restoration we are in the last days our world has experienced many things that the bible has mentioned will happen in the last days church family like it or not we are in the last days and we must stay true to the lord i heard over the past few days that there's over 2.5 million people that either rejected christ or haven't even heard of his word before. It is our very duty to spread God's word, to proclaim and not fall for Satan's temptations. The Bible says there will be false prophets and they will deceive people and us as a Seventh-day Adventist must stay strong and turn away. How many of you guys want to, be, want to be prepared when God comes? Please stand. And I hope all you guys will stand because you guys will continue and be a better Christian. <laughs> 